Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today, we'll continue our anesthesiology playlist. It's time to talk about pharmacokinetics, aka what your body does to the drug. This is my great anesthesiology playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Today is video number four. Let's answer the question of the previous video. What are the consequences or the complications of hypothermia? For a freaking emergency room doctors, the complications of hypothermia are, are prominent because more people die from extreme cold than from extreme heat. Something to keep in your mind. For anesthesiologists, however, hypothermia increases your risk of delayed wound healing, wound infection, blood loss, nitrogen loss, cardiac mobility, hospitalization, and post-operative complications. How can I intervene? Treat the hypothermia by forced air warming blankets. Keep the patient warm. Try your best. Give warm fluids. Even the IV fluids that you're giving to the patient, warm them before you give them. And cover the patient from his upper esophageal sphincter all the way to his external anal sphincter. You even cover the head. As I've explained before, anesthesia is either general, regional, or local. And this is the most important slide in every lecture. Okay, with general, regional, local. Re general could be inhaled or IV. Regional, neuraxial, limb, and others. Local, or esters or amides. Now, for pharmacokinetics, what's the definition? What your body does to the drug. How about pharmacodynamics? What the drug does to your body. Pharmacokinetics consists of ADME. Or as my woke professor used to say, it's like Adam spelled funny. What is wrong with these people? A. Absorption. D. Distribution. M. Metabolism. E. Excretion. What is absorption? So let's say I took an oral medication. Okay, absorption is to get that freaking medication from my gut and into the bloodstream. Okay, so from the site of administration, gut, to my blood. What if I took the medication subcutaneously? Then from underneath the skin to the blood. Next, what is distribution? Take that beautiful drug from the blood and to tissues. How about metabolism? You see that beautiful drug that you took? Yep, this is the first form of the drug. We will convert this to another form. Example, let's say that you took an active medication. We can convert into an active, aka taking it to the cleaners, the scientific term being uh, inactive metabolite or degradation products, or you can convert the drug from inactive to active or from active to more active or from active to toxic. Like my last relationship, I'm just joking. And last we have excretion. Take that drug from the second form, okay, after metabolism, and then dump it into the kidney or dump it into the stool or dump it into the bile or into the sweat or into the water vapor so that you can exhale. <sighs> if you have watched my endocrinology playlist, we have talked about a tale of two hormones. We have the lipid soluble and the water soluble. The gap between them is unbridgeable. Lipid soluble is the same as fat soluble, is the same as water insoluble, is the same as non-polar. However, water soluble is lipid insoluble, but polar. As you know, your blood has plasma. It's watery, but the cell membrane is made of lipid bilayer. It is fatty. Your blood is watery. Your cell membrane is fatty. Charles Dickens once said, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Let's say we have a lipid soluble hormone. Okay. Can a lipid float into the blood, which is watery? No, because water and lipid hate each other. So you have to carry it on the shoulder of a plasma protein. Could be albumin, could be globulin. Once it reaches the cell, oh, now it's time for it to diffuse through the membrane because this is lipid inside lipid. Lipid through lipid. It will pass through the membrane like a sharp knife through warm butter. Conversely, a water-soluble hormone can float freely in the plasma. I do not need a plasma protein. But when I get to the cell, I cannot enter through the membrane because the membrane is lipid and I am water-soluble. Therefore, you have to put a receptor for me on the outside. And therefore, medicosis says everything was lipid-soluble. Everything was water-soluble. Everything was bound to plasma protein. It was freely floating in the serum. Its receptor was internal inside the cell. Its receptor was external on the outside surface of the cell. It was a genomic action. It was a non-genomic action. It was slowly acting. It was rapidly acting. 
The genomic versus the non-genomic action was illustrated in my endocrinology playlist, so please refer to those videos. Where would you put the receptor? Well, if you are a water-soluble hormone, I have to put it on the outside because you cannot enter into the cell. I have to like wait for you outside. But if you are lipid-soluble and you can pass through the membrane like a sharp knife through warm butter, I can put the receptor on the inside, either cytoplasm or nucleus. The comparison between lipid-soluble and water-soluble was discussed before. Now we'll focus about this, lipid-soluble versus water-soluble. Okay, lipid-soluble, it needs to be bound to a plasma protein. However, water soluble can just float freely in the plasma. If you are water soluble, you are ionized, but if you're lipid soluble, you're non ionized. If you're lipid soluble, you need plasma protein. If you're water soluble, you're floating freely in the plasma. Physiologically speaking, lipid soluble hormones are usually more inactive. Why? Because they cannot bind direct to the receptor. They have to be carried on a plasma protein. They can just float in the plasma and go wherever they want. Someone has to carry them. This will slow them down. On the other hand, water soluble are actively and freely floating in the serum. They can just jump onto the receptor that's rapidly acting. This was physiological. Now, please pay attention, doofus, because pharmacologically speaking, they are the opposite. The lipid soluble is active, but the water soluble is inactive because pharmacology is concerned with a totally different animal. Pharmacology is asking a simple question. Can you pass through membranes? In other words, can you enter the brain and pass through the blood-brain barrier? Can you enter into cells? If the answer is yes, you're active. If the answer is no, we will consider you inactive. Hey, lipid solubles, can you pass through membranes, including the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, of course. How about your... Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot. Can you pass through the lipid uh, liver cell membrane? Sure. How about you? Ah, oh, I cannot. Therefore, the lipid soluble portion of the drug is more likely to be metabolized in the liver. Since you are lipid soluble, the kidney will not be able to excrete you because once you enter into the kidney tubules, you'll be reabsorbed because you're very good at passing through membranes, including the tubular cell membrane. However, water soluble is always being dumped in the urine. Now, here's a surprise. The same drug can have a lipid-soluble fraction and a water-soluble fraction at the same time. One drug can have non-ionized fraction and ionized fraction simultaneously. What determines the degree of ionization of the freaking drug? The pK of the drug and the pH of the medium. What if pK of the drug is exactly the same as the pH of the medium? At this sweet spot, 50% of that drug will be non-ionized and the other 50% will be ionized. Therefore, you can define the pK as it's the pH at which the non-ionized fraction of the drug equals the ionized fraction. If you remember my videos on acetyl salicylic acid, aka aspirin, in my bleeding and coagulation playlist, we have talked about alkalinization of the urine. Okay, acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin is a freaking acid, like it's in the name. If you put this stinking acid in an acidic medium, there is a rule in pharmacology that says like reabsorbs like. This will favor reabsorption and the aspirin will end up being reabsorbed back into your blood. But if you put this stinking acid in an alkaline medium or an alkaline urine, this will favor secretion and this stinking aspirin will end up in the urine, not in the blood. Like reabsorbs like. Put an acid in an acid, it will get reabsorbed. Put an acid in a base, it will get trashed. Therefore, how can we treat aspirin toxicity? Alkalinize the urine. So this is so easy, it's unbelievable. Just four possibilities. A 10-year-old child can memorize four scenarios. You can do it, baby. Stop whining. Do you want some cheese with that wine? Be careful because uh, tyramine toxicity, especially if you're taking a mouth inhibitor. That was a pharmacology joke that just went over your head. Put an acid in an acidic medium, it will be non-ionized and it will favor reabsorption and the drug will stay in your system. Put the freaking acid in a basic medium, it will become ionized, favoring secretion and it will be dumped, usually by the kidney. A base in a base, reabsorption. A base in an acid, secretion. Barbiturates are acidic. Feel the burn, feel the bobs. What are the two barbiturates that are used as general anesthetics? Thiopental, methohexatel. They are acidic, baby. How about opiates and local anesthetics? They are basic. So if you put the barbs, acids, 
In an acidic medium, they will get reabsorbed. If you put them in a basic medium, they will get dumped. If you put the opiates or local anesthetic in a basic medium, they will get reabsorbed. If you put them in an acidic medium, they will get secreted. Let's talk about physiology. The stomach secretes gastrin. Gastrin stimulates the parietal cell to secrete protons, the acid. That's why your stomach is acidic. However, the small bowel has secretin. Secretin stimulates exocrine pancreas to secrete tons of water and bicarbonate. And that's why your intestine is alkaline. Now, here is a shocker. The alkaline drug will be absorbed in the intestine. Of course, because this is a base. In a basic medium, it will favor absorption. However, an acidic drug will be absorbed in the stomach because it's an acid in an acid. A drug can enter via passive transport or active transport. Passive is subdivided into simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. No carrier, carrier. To learn more, watch my physiology playlist. I have two videos about these topics. Who can pass faster through a lipid membrane? If you're lipid soluble, you have an advantage. If you're small, you have an advantage. If you're liquid, you have an advantage. And crystalloids are way better than colloids. And that's why if a patient came to the emergency department in a state of hemorrhage or shock or hemorrhagic shock because of severe bleeding, what do we give them? Crystalloids, not colloids. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. What are the factors that affect diffusion? We have talked about them before in my physiology playlist. The concentration gradient, that is helpful. The surface area, the more the merrier. Temperature, the higher the greater. However, if the molecular size is big, that's not good. If the length of the diffusion or the thickness of the membrane is big, that's not good. Therefore, anything that will increase your body temperature will cause vasodilation, which will increase the absorption of the drug because you increased the surface area. Amazing. But in a state of shock, or if I give you epinephrine to vasoconstrict vessels, you will decrease your surface area, which will decrease the absorption of a medication. This is the difference between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. You will plateau because you have a Vmax, because at a certain point, the carrier will get saturated and it will get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Math nerds have been telling us for decades that the shortest path between two lines is the straight line. Medicosis will say the shortest path to the circulation is the IV route. Hashtag bioavailability. Hashtag no first pass metabolism. What in the actual F is the first pass metabolism? Here is the deal. Let's say you took an oral medication. Okay, ended up in your stomach, intestine, okay, and then you absorb it into the liver. The liver will destroy it before it reaches your systemic circulation, before it reaches the heart, before it goes to tissue. However, if you give me the drug intravenously, this will escape the liver because you dump it straight to my systemic circulation. And that's why intravenous drugs have the highest bioavailability. If I tell you that this medication is 50% bioavailable, it means that it has half the bioavailability of the intravenous ones. We compare every drug to the quintessential bioavailable route, which is the intravenous one. My great hero, Dr. Thomas Sowell, once said, despite the voluminous and often fervent literature on income distribution, the cold fact is that most income is not distributed. It is earned. Preach. Unlike Dr. Thomas Sowell, however, pharmacology professors are a bunch of, well, postmodern neo-Marxist ideologue. They're always talking about drug distribution and redistribution. It's just an abhorrent idea, and that's that. Now it's time to talk about distribution, taking the drug from the blood after absorption and putting it into tissue, distributing it to tissue. Distribution, take me from the blood to the tissue. Here's a question for you. Why does L-fentanyl have a faster onset than fentanyl? Is because the pK of alfentanil is closer to your blood pH, which is 7.4. This will help it pass through membranes, including the blood brain barrier, and before you know it, alfentanil has reached your brain. Plasma protein binding. If you're water soluble, ah, you don't need a plasma protein. But if you're lipid soluble, you need a plasma protein. If you're an acidic drug, it's probably albumin. Basic drug, it's probably alpha-1 acid glycoprotein plasma protein. Don't forget, the same drug can have an ionized portion and a non-ionized portion at the same time. The phenomenon of ion trapping. Imagine that mommy is taking opiates or she's a heroin head. Opiates are basic. Normally, 
fetal's pH is between 7.25 and 7.35. And as you know, the adult blood pH, the arterial one, is between 7.35 and 7.45. In other words, baby's blood is more acidic when compared to mommy's. Opiates are basic. Mommy takes opiates. Opiates will cross the placenta and go to the baby. Inside the baby's body, oh, opiates are basic. When you put a basic in a relatively more acidic solution, they will get ionized and they will be trapped. Why? Because if you're ionized, you cannot cross membranes. You cannot cross the placenta. You cannot go back from the baby to mommy and the opiates will be trapped inside the baby's blood. Even when the concentration of opiates in the baby's blood is way, 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 way higher than that in mommy's blood, they will be still trapped here even against the concentration gradient. So before you even think about getting pregnant, please consider stopping the opiates and the alcohol and make sure to take iron and folate. Drug distribution and redistribution. Distribution, so you have absorbed the drug. Absorption is from the gut or from the site of administration to the blood. And then distribution from the blood to tissues. Who's gonna get most of that drug? The highly vascular organs, brain, heart, liver, kidneys. 10% of the total body mass receives about 70% of the cardiac output. AKA, these four organs receive more than their fair share, no pun intended. After this, when the plasma concentration of the medication decreases, the drug will be redistributed to the disenfranchised organs, like the adipose tissue and the skeletal muscles. Enough with my dad jokes. Percy said the rich have become richer and the poor have become poorer. But medicosis says the richly vascular organs are getting distribution and the poorly vascular organs are getting redistribution. But hey medicosis, I want to ask you about something. My physiology professor told us that skeletal muscles receive about 20% of the cardiac output and the brain only receives 13% and this is during rest. How come you tell me that the brain is more vascular and therefore receives more of the drug distribution than the skeletal muscles? Look here, my friend, your woke physiology professor is using gross figures. And as you know, gross figures are <clears throat> gross. If you want to know the truth, you got to get granular. Hashtag stratification. I want you to look at your body. How many skeletal muscles do you have? 620 on average. Now look at your brain. How many brains do you have? Just one. Which one is heavier? The 620 skeletal muscles or just one brain? Of course, the 620 muscles are heavier. I mean, just look at your biceps, triceps, quadriceps, and hamstrings. So it is true that if you put all of your skeletal muscles together, they receive more blood than the brain. However, if you get granular and do it as blood flow per percentage of body mass, you will get a totally different story. You'll find that the brain per unit of mass receives way more blood than any stinking skeletal muscle in your body. And that's why we do not let physiology professors anywhere near patients. Question, why is the patient awakened early and suddenly after a single dose of thiopental? Like the anesthesiologist gave me thiopental to knock me unconscious, but in the middle of the surgery, I just woke up quickly and faster than expected. What happened? When the woke anesthesiologist gave me the thiopental, this is quickly distributed to all of these organs. Amazing. However, easy come, easy go. It's gonna leave the brain through the blood brain barrier because it's lipid soluble, and then it will go quickly to other tissue. Now, the concentration of thiopental in the brain has dropped like a rock, and I will wake up in the middle of the surgery. Therefore, what's the solution? Give multiple doses of thiopental. What will that do? It will saturate all of the peripheral receptors, saturate all of the receptors in the adipose, all of the receptors in the skeletal muscles, and therefore the there will be no gradient and no incentive for the drug to leave the brain and to go to the disenfranchised tissue. Another problem, fentanyl is short acting. What should I do? Give fentanyl via continuous infusion. Why? To saturate the inactive sites that are readily available for redistribution. And that's why an anesthesiologist without pharmacology is like me without YouTube, useless. Next, let's talk about metabolism. Metabolism, taking a drug from one form into another form. 
from active to inactive, from inactive to active, or from active to more active, or from active to toxic. I was at a Starbucks one day, and I heard the baristas talking to each other. One of them said, my last relationship was so toxic. I just remember metabolism in pharmacokinetics. That's how my brain rolls. Most of the time, metabolism is transforming active into inactive. What do you mean? Lipid soluble, that can cross membrane, into water soluble that will be dumped in the kidney. This conversion makes you increase the excretion of the drug, but it decreases its volume of distribution, as you know. Volatile or inhaled anesthetics are usually excreted through the lungs. However, vicuronium is excre excreted through the bile. Erythromycin is the same thing. Most of the drugs, however, are dumped in the kidney. But of course, the kidney can only dump you when you are water soluble. And that's why metabolism comes before secretion. Some pearls for the pros. Propofol is rapidly metabolized, usually extrahepatically. Also, it has slow redistribution from the poorly perfused back to the blood. Therefore, what's the solution? Give it as IV infusion. In the next video, we'll talk about pharmacodynamics, what the drug does to your body, how the drug jumps onto the receptor like a key in a lock, like a truck in a dock. Don't forget to review the most important slide in every single stinking lecture. Question of the day, should the patient stop the beta blockers on the day before surgery? Another question, should the patient stop beta blockers on the day of the surgery? You can let me know the answer in the comment section. The correct answer will be found in the next video. If you want to learn more about the pH, bicarbonate, carbon dioxide, base excess, base deficit, check out my acid-base imbalance course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. Moreover, please download my autonomic pharmacology course because it can help you tremendously, especially in anesthesiology. Thank you for watching and please forgive my dad jokes. Subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.